Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We just got finished with Romans chapter 8, which is sort of the crown jewel of the book of Romans. It's probably the most quoted uh, chapter in all of Romans, or certainly one of them. But now we hear, we're here in chapter 9, and listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, why would he say, I'm telling you the truth and I'm not lying? Well, apparently, he's about to tell us something that we may have a hard time believing. And so we do this kind of thing, too. We'll say, hey, let me tell you something. Hey, this is no joke. Or, hey, this is absolutely the truth. Or, this is no lie. We're prefacing with this so that people will know we're really being honest. So Paul says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that, verse 2, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Boy, that's quite the run. The gist of this here is Paul saying, I have this continual grief in my heart that my own countrymen, my own people, the Israelites, whom we generally refer to as the Jews, that the majority of them do not believe in Yeshua, Jesus as Messiah. And Paul said, oh, I could wish that I myself were accursed. In other words, that I would be without Christ and go to hell if I could see that all of my countrymen could be saved. So this is, this is deep. But I love this list because really he answers here better than he does in chapter 3, the question that he asks in chapter 3, what advantage is there to being Jewish? And he asked a similar question in chapter 4. What advantage uh, did Abraham have? What advantage is there to being Jewish over Gentile, which is non-Jewish? So listen to what he says here. He says, Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, talking about the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant from Moses, the Davidic covenant from David, right? The covenants, the giving of the law that was through Moses, you know, the first five books of the Bible, the service of God, the whole serving of the tabernacle, the Levites and such. And then the promises, all the promises. Of course, at this time that he's writing this, the only assembled book, uh, recognized scriptures are the Old Testament, as we call it, but the promises, all those beautiful promises all over the Old Testament that still many of them apply to us, of whom are the fathers. Well, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on. Uh, sometimes we know them as the patriarchs. Uh, from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. What advantage there, is there to be a Jew? Jesus came through the Jews. Jesus is Jewish. And then Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now notice verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. So wait a minute. They're of Israel, but they're not all Israel. And they are the seed of Abraham, but they're not all the children of Abraham. So what are we talking about here? Well, notice, keep reading in verse 8. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah 
shall have a son. Now, what is he talking about? Well, Abraham first had Ishmael through Hagar. And so is Ishmael the seed of Abraham? Well, he absolutely is. But is he the seed that received the blessing? Is he the seed and the, the lineage of the Messiah? Absolutely not. Because it was through Sarah that Abraham was supposed to have a child, through his barren wife, who's now elderly. It's through her that he's supposed to have the son of promise. And with that son, Isaac, God was going to make his covenant and bring the Messiah through that son. And of course, bless uh, Abraham's descendants abundantly through that lineage. Abraham and Sarah having Isaac. And then he goes on, notice to say, verse 10, and not only this, we're going to pick it up from that generation. And not only this, but when Rebecca, now who is Rebecca? Rebecca is Isaac's wife. It says, not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac, for the children had not yet, uh, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to the election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. That was a parenthetical statement. Verse 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Well, one of those prophecies came while she was pregnant. The older shall serve the younger. And then the other was said later, once the, the children grew up, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So, uh, so God is showing that with Abraham, Abraham had these two sons, and he went on to have other children later. But uh, think about this. Abraham had to be healed just to have Isaac because it took so long. Uh, Abraham could have children before because he had Ishmael through Hagar. But then he got so old that the, body, the Bible says his body was as good as dead. It says that in chapter 4 of Romans. And so he had to be healed again to be able to, at 99 conceive a child with his 90-year-old wife who was formerly barren. So he has Ishmael, and then years later he has Isaac. But once he's healed, guess what? He went on to have more children. He lived to 175 years old. He went on to have other children. So Abraham had two sons originally, Ishmael and Isaac. God did not choose Ishmael, but he chose Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And God did not choose Esau, but he chose Jacob. So now God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And then Israel had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And from Jacob or from Israel, all the children of Jacob received the blessing of Abraham. So for the first two generations, God chose a particular son. But once we had Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, everybody in Israel's downline is part of the blessing of Abraham. And this is why we say, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because you have to get down to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, before it's everybody in that descendancy. Does that make sense? So Paul is bringing out here, though, that he's saying, oh, I want all of Israel to be saved. But then he's saying, but let me just talk to you that not all of Abraham's seed is Israel, or they're not really children. And even with the son of promise, Isaac, not all of his sons received the blessing of Abraham and the covenant blessings. But Jacob, I have loved, and Esau, I have hated. So Jacob is the one that received it. So let's go on now here. And we're picking it up now. Let's see. In verse 13, as it is written, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? In other words, by God choosing, is God sinning? Is God doing something wrong? And he answers that question, certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Now what's, what is he saying here? He's, he's saying, look, don't try to indict God and and apply what you think is the right or wrong, just or, or unjust, fair or unfair, grid onto God. God always does things right. And not only that, God has the prerogative. He is God. So 
if there is any morality, he invented it. If there is a right way to do it, he came up with it. So therefore, God never errs. He never does wrong. And so uh, Paul is saying here, look, even through Moses, God said, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Now, here's something interesting. Let me just, you may want to look at this too, but let me read from Exodus chapter 20. Some of you would remember that Exodus chapter 20 is where the Ten Commandments were first given. Exodus chapter 20, and we'll look at, I believe it's, uh, we can start it back at, chapter, at verse 4, actually, I think. Exodus 20 and verse 4. Uh, well, verse 2 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then verse 3 is the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4 is the second. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now watch this. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Isn't that interesting? But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So back to what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 9 that uh, somebody might say, well, look, if God's choosing Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, is there unrighteousness with God? And Paul answers, certainly not. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. But notice that God even tells us who he's going to have mercy on. He said, I'll have mercy on those who love me and keep my commandments. And so it's not just that God is random and saying, you know, this, these are all lame brains, but I'm just going to bless that lame brain a lot. But these other ones, I'm not going to give them any help. No, God wants everybody to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. But God does look at different people and sees different characteristics, different responses, different uh, uh, character traits like humility versus pride. And the Bible says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In the same way, God is making the decision. What Paul's point is, is this. Don't try to apply your morality on God as if your morality is more perfect than his. God's morality is perfect. And if God chooses to use one person over another, he has very good reasons for it, and it makes sense. Okay, so this is what Paul is saying. Don't question God's morality. Now, you may question and say, God, help me to understand how you're doing this, but don't question whether it's right or wrong. It's always right with God. Okay, verse 16. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. What does that mean, him who wills? It's not what you want to do. In other words, it's not just certain people wanted mercy and other people didn't, or certain, certain people wanted somebody else to have mercy and, and didn't want others to have mercy. So it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. So even our actions don't necessarily tell God what to do. You remember that, that Pharaoh hardened his heart when Moses was saying, let my people go. Several times Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but sometimes God hardened his heart. Well, why is that? Well, God could not show him mercy. Well, why not? Did God not love him? Of course God loved him. But God had sworn to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. Well, the Egyptians had cursed the people of God. God had to retaliate upon them to keep his covenant. So even though Pharaoh may have wanted to have mercy, God could not show him mercy because God had already made a covenant to Abraham I have to curse those. I will curse those who curse you. So this is why God had to keep standing Pharaoh up and hitting Egypt again, standing him back up and hitting them again, 
because God had to get out the level of cursing that he had promised Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse him who curses you. And so God had to do this. God keeps his covenant. And so uh, it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God. God is thinking through all of these scenarios, and he's the one that makes these ultimate decisions. Verse 17, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very, very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So because God needed to retaliate upon the Egyptians, God raised up Pharaoh, brought him to prominence and such, so that he could carry out his covenant and his plans. Verse 18, therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Just like I told you, he had to harden Pharaoh's heart. When Pharaoh was willing to buckle and give in, God, God was saying, no, I've got to hit Egypt a few more times because I swore that I would curse at the level that you cursed my people. So that's why he had to harden Pharaoh's heart. But maybe you didn't understand that. And this is what Paul's saying. You don't have to understand it. God always does it right. And he has the prerogative. He's God. Okay, so verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? In other words, if God's just making these decisions, then what do we have to do with it? Why, do we, why, do, why does he still find fault? Why does God still find fault if he's the one ultimately ultimately making the decision. For who has resisted his will? Verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed to say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known to the riches of his might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he called not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles as he said says also in Hosea I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them you are not my people there they shall be called sons of the living God. And so notice that God in his foreknowledge and in his foresight, he chose certain people for certain things. And he has the prerogative to do it. And so when he does it, we need to be careful that we're not trying to control God and get God to do anything. Listen, anything that he has not himself promised to do or covenanted to do. If God promised something or covenanted to do it, we, we're not boxing God in. He boxed himself in. He made a covenant. And he's faithful to keep those covenants if we'll do our part, of course. But we have to be careful that we don't indict God for making these decisions. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. And so uh, God has chosen that even when Israel was going astray and such, God would lean in and save a remnant save a few, so that the covenant would continue, so that, for example, the line of David would continue, so that there would be a Messiah. God is always wanting to influence and try to keep things on track, even when people mess it up. Verse 30, what shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they, Israel, did not seek it by faith. See, they were trying to keep the law to be righteous. But the Gentiles, no, they accepted the gospel by faith. They weren't under the law because they weren't Jewish. 
So why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Talking about the Jews. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. Who's the stumbling stone? Well, it was Jesus, and it's also the gospel of Jesus. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him, see the stumbling stone is a person, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So Paul is explaining about his heart for his own people and saying, my own people stumbled over their own Messiah. Their own Messiah comes to them and he says, here I am. I came to fulfill these promises and I came to save you, to die for you and so on. And they just could not fathom that that's him. I mean, he doesn't look like anything special. And how do we know it's him? And if it's him, why doesn't he overthrow the Roman government and set up the kingdom like the predictions of prophecy say the Messiah will do? See, they didn't realize that there would be two comings of the Messiah, the first coming to die and the second coming to reign. They thought it was all going to be in the same coming. And so Jesus, who is the foundation of the covenant and the building of uh, God's will for the Jewish people, well, they stumbled over that stone. And they thought, what's that dumb stone doing here anyway? And so Paul is saying, this just grieves my heart that this is happening. God has saved a remnant. There are uh, a small relatively small percentage of the Jews who believe in Jesus. It's a growing percentage. Praise the Lord. But we're going to see as this plays out in the next couple of chapters that Paul shows us that by the Jews stumbling over the stumbling stone of Jesus and not accepting Jesus and actually being sort of broken off of the flow and the covenant of God, well, that gave room for the Gentiles to come in, not to replace the Jews, but to tap into this covenant of the Jews. The covenant of the Jews has not ended. It's still here. The Abrahamic covenant is still here. And we Gentiles get to be a part of this Abrahamic covenant. But he's going to explain here in the next couple of chapters that if we who were not a part of the original covenant can be grafted into this original covenant, covenant, how much more can those who were a part be grafted back in? And thank God that's what God wants us to do, to provoke the Jews to jealousy so that they might come and know the Messiah that we know. His name is Yeshua, Hebrew, Jesus, the way that we say it, but that they might know their own Messiah. That's what God wants us to do, and that's what we'll see in the next couple of chapters. So I enjoyed chapter 9. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 10.